It's good to be in worship with you, and I just want to uh, preface the scripture reading by saying this is a new sermon series that we're entering into. Uh, we're going to be talking about the call, specifically the call of a disciple, uh, which means if you've been baptized, then there's a call that has been put on your life to be a minister of the gospel. There is a call to be a disciple, and so we're going to talk for the next four weeks about what that means. And the initial part is just hearing the calling. Before you can answer the call, before you can do something with the call, you have to be able to hear the call. Uh, and so we're going to study maybe one of my favorite responses to not hearing the call, because it's not that Jonah didn't hear the call. Jonah didn't want to hear the call. You get the difference there? Joe, you get what I'm saying. All right. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, Jonah 3 verses 1 through 5, and then verse 10, but I'm going to cover the whole book of Jonah, basically. We're going to, we're going to, so, so buckle up, get ready, don't look at the clock, let's just go and do this thing. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please have a seat. I'm going to tell you, one of the most annoying phrases that I've ever heard. And there's a lot of them. I'm not going to lie, but this one is up there, and I think that most of you will agree. And what this phrase is, very short, very directive, the phone's ringing. Now, I want you to think about when someone says, the phone's ringing, what that implicates. They are telling you that they can hear the phone is ringing, right? Somebody is trying to call. But what they're also saying is they are too daggone lazy to get up and answer the phone. Why else would you tell me that the phone's ringing? If you can hear the phone's ringing and you know how to operate that device, why don't you answer the phone? Now, I'm going to tell you a phrase that's even more annoying than that, than the phone's ringing. Who is it? What happens here, Wade, is I have gotten up because you told me the phone's ringing. I have answered the phone because I have chosen not lethargy. I have chosen to do something with my life to get up to answer the phone. And I answer the phone, and Lainey looks at me, and she says, who is it? I said, the phone's for you. She said, who is it? What they are really saying is, I might need you to lie for me. There are seven deadly sins, and we're already about at two of them, and we might get to murder if we keep pushing along at this discourse. But that is what is so frustrating, is we sit there, and they want you to say, they can't come to the phone, because they're too lazy. They won't respond to the call. It's not that they don't hear it, right? Because they've said the phone is ringing. They've actually made the most polarizing observation that there is a call. Now on the phone and in life, there are calls we want to answer and there are calls that we do not want to answer. Amen? That there are play bill collectors, telemarketers, or, and I have a name for this person, 
And there's one in my family who I won't point out who they are, but they are probably the worst I know. I call them, you've heard of The Gambler, that old movie back in the day? There's a song, The Gambler. There's what I call The Rambler. The Rambler is somebody who could tell you a message in 30 seconds, yet because God created them to give you every single detail in the equation, it takes 30 minutes for them to tell you that they didn't have bread at Food Line. It's not Sarah, by the way. I'm not, I'm honestly, it's not Sarah. So I don't want to be like, Sarah, when you were gone, Jonathan called you out in church. She is not my rambler. I'm more of the rambler than she is. But what my point is, is in life and on the phone, there are calls we don't want to answer, and there are calls that we do want to answer. There are places that we want to go and places we don't want to go. But the important thing I need you to know is that if, if you, and you can throw up your phone ringing it is. Answer it. You must. That's a shout out to all the, I like, Casey likes that a lot, so at least I got one. We've got, and there's water. I didn't know that. There's water still in this. Must be a week old baptism water. Two weeks old. So you can come touch it if you want to. But th- that, that water signifies your baptism. And it signifies something very specific that you have a calling. So if you believe that right now, I want you to say, I have a calling. I want you to turn to your neighbor, the person beside you. I want you to look at it. I want you to say, I have a calling. <laughs> All right. Now everybody knows they got a call, and so they can't have anybody else say, who is it? What do they want? I'm not here. Jonah got a direct call from God. All right, we're going to flip back in to Jonah 1. It says, The Lord came to Jonah, told him, Go at once to Nineveh, to that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went and he got on a boat, right? And you know, this is the interesting thing to me, is that we know Jonah fled a call, right? That was the, you know, probably top five stories you learned in Sunday school as a wee child, right? It's always cool to see a dude got swallowed up, right? It wasn't a fish because it was a whale. We want to make sure we're teaching, you know, good science in this place. So he gets swallowed up by the whale, right? Right. Okay. That is not the most interesting part of Jonah's calling. What we miss is why did Jonah hang up on God's call? Does anybody know that's not sitting behind me? It's not because he was afraid that they would treat him bad. It's a good guess. There's other prophets who thought. Does anybody else want to guess? Huh? He didn't like them. He didn't like them. I'm going to talk more about it. But the reason Jonah didn't go is because he was afraid they would actually listen to God. That's how much, like, there's some Tar Heels that I'm not the biggest fans of. There's some Tar Heels that I love in this place, so don't feel bad. I've got Tar Heels in my parentals, in my family. I would never be so bold, be like, well, I'm not going to tell them. They, you know, they might actually die if I don't tell them this, but I'm afraid that they, they might actually live if I don't. So I, I, you know, I'm just not going to tell them. I'm going to let that one go under the radar. No, there is nobody, there is no enemy, there is no person that I feel so strongly against that I wouldn't want to tell them what God has told me to tell them, Right? God has been called to go to Nineveh and to say, straighten up. Get it together, straighten up or else. See, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. This was basically the biggest um, detractor, the, the, the biggest threat to the Jewish people, okay? There was Assyria and then Israel, the people of Israel. And they had this conflict going on. And so to to Jonah, the people of Nineveh were a bunch of pagans who deserved all the hell, fire, and brimstone God could throw upon their heads. 
So chapter 3 is the second call God made. Did you notice that when I read that, that, that verse, the very first word? It says the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, right? So it's already come once, and then he ran and he went into uh, uh, the whale. You can't run from the calling. He hung up on God in chapter 1. He literally, literally ran away from God's call, and God pursued Jonah until Jonah would listen. So here's the first nugget to take away. When God calls, we are wise to answer the first time. That's the thing I've learned about God's call. God doesn't quit on the call, right? God is the person you can't hang up on. God is that person that you can't get off the phone with. Jonah knew exactly what God wanted in this call. Oftentimes, we blame a bad connection, but really, it's we don't want to hear the connection. Now, I, 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 and I did this on Facebook, so I want to know, but I want, I want to know if I just need to go to the altar a little longer this morning to repent. Has anybody else ever done the fake bad reception? Where like they don't want to, you don't want to talk, and you're like, Hi, I, it, right, uh, bad reception. Like has anybody, has anybody ever done, can we just be, can we, can we just be, can we be community right now? Could be, thank you, there were, and there's more hands coming up, praise God, revival is in this place. We are slow but steady, every hand will raise. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that they have had fake reception. We've come to this place. Jonah eventually came to hear the word of the Lord that, that he has to walk the length of Nineveh, right? So part of it might be, it's not just he gets a megaphone, shouts for an hour, and then gets to sit down. He's got to walk the entire land shouting to them, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Can you imagine being a Jewish prophet in Assyria shouting to all the people who hate you that you will be destroyed? Can you imagine that? Like, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know why I have notes because I always end up going somewhere else off it. I remember going in 2004. Uh, it was my sophomore year of college. I went to the NC State Carolina football game. It was over uh, Thanksgiving break. And, and in uh, Keenan Flagger at the, at, the, at the football stadium at Chapel Hill, I got really good tickets. Now, I could get on. It was with the season ticket holders. And here, I'm just going to tell you, every time me and my friend would stand up, these old Rams club people would say, can you please sit down? We're trying to watch the game. It's a football game. You stand up for the game. But anyway... What happened, if you remember that game, T.A. McClendon, does anybody remember him? He was a really good running back for NC State. The way that that game ended is T.A. McClendon rushed in for a touchdown, and time expired, and they called it a touchdown, and state, some heads are shaking back. State won. But then, and this was before instant replay, the other ref, who was on the opposite end of the field, runs up to him, talks to him, and says, no, uh-uh, actually, no, it's not good. And they took the touchdown away. It was the most contentious football game I had ever been at. And I was so mad. And I was with Jennifer White, who was literally like five foot one, 60 pounds. So it wasn't like I was rolling with my boys and we could. So I was so mad. I was like, no, no. And I walked around the corner and there was this fight of like seven Chapel Hill guys and three state guys. And I, I was like, take your shirt off, Jennifer. Flip it on inside. We're not like. I didn't even want to be at a football game with the opponent's shirt on because I didn't want to throw down. Can you imagine walking through the greatest enemy you know who was killed and persecuted and you're supposed to walk through the entire line saying, hey, guess what, dude? You're going to hell. You better figure it out. Right? He's telling, turn away. Get it fixed. So maybe he was a little afraid. But Scripture doesn't tell us it was fear that he would be persecuted or killed. It was the fear that God's people would answer the call. The fear isn't always what happens. The fear isn't always what we do with the call. The fear is what happens if we follow the call. Amen? You stepping up, it's, it's not, 
It's, if I do this, what's going to happen? And what happened? Jonah 3, 5, and 4. If you'll go to the next, uh, that should be the scriptures. In, in verse 5 of chapter 3, the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. So they did exactly what happens when God does his thing, right? This is chapter 4. You see that? So you see this has happened after the people turn around. This is what Jonah, he was very, dis, it says this was displeasing to Jonah. Actually very displeasing. And he became angry. Jonah became angry. He prayed to the Lord. This is when you know you have a life and relationship with God when you can make this your prayer Oh, Lord, is not this what I said? Well, I was still in my own country. That's why I fled Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God. You are merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. He says, God, I knew that you're awesome and you're forgiving, but they're not awesome. And they don't deserve forgiveness. His fear was that the people of Nineveh would answer God's call and that God would spare them. And guess what happened? Exactly that. They repented and God forgave them. They turned away. They turned to God and they were spared. And so I want to make a quick note that everyone's call will be different. And how they respond will be different. I'm going to fly through this text of Mark, but I think if you'll go to the next slide, it's so interesting that after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee. He was preaching and proclaiming good news, saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the city of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and immediately they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. When Jesus came to Simon and Andrew, when he came to John, when he came to these men at their jobs, they didn't wait until the five o'clock whistle, right? They didn't say, well, let me finish it up with my dad. He gets real mad when I just leave. Jesus said, follow me. They went immediately, right? It's, It's kind of the exact opposite of Jonah, if you think about it. Jonah has to be pursued by God in the belly of a whale, These men who never had met him before completely drop their nets and leave all they've ever known, including their family, and follow Jesus. And they're both beautiful stories, the call of a disciple, right? They're both amazing. Faith is a gift, right? 1 Corinthians 2. 13 to faith is a gift and so in some of us God has poured in great faith so God can come to you and God can say this is what you need to do and you can leave everything and you can drop every it's like, this is where God is calling for some of us we hear God calling but we keep telling somebody else you need to answer that the phone's ringing And God has to repeat the call. So some immediately drop their nets and leave, and some have to get sucked into the belly of the beast. But the joy is it's the same God calling all of us. Calling to us and for us out of the grace of God. And our calling is not just to the people that we love and like. Okay, that's a big thing for us, Kitty Hawk. It's not just to the people that we love and we like and we get along with 
And there are friends. Jonah was so disheartened from the whole experience that he ran into the desert to cry. That's what scripture tells us. So, so going into, 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 into chapter four of Jonah in this story, so God does this miraculous thing to deliver this entire empire over to God. His grace pours out all over them, and yet he goes into the desert to pout so much that he asks God to take his life. He said, God, just take my life. I don't want to live with this result. His complaint is a gem. He says, this is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. Jonah wants God to be merciful and loving to him, to his friends, and to his family. He wants God to be merciful, slow to anger to the people he cares about. He does not want God to love the Ninevites. He does not want God to love those he perceives as his enemy, but our calling is not just to love and like those that we love and like. Amen? And I must confess right here and now that I get like Jonah. Right? I get like Jonah. I, 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 I wish I could say, I just don't get it, but I, you know, I just can't understand why in the world Jonah would be like that. But I completely and utterly get it. I'm so very happy that God is generous and graceful to my wife and to my children, and to my family, and to my friends, and to my church. But there are some folks, it's just hard to like them. Let alone love them. And then I am reminded of the central principle of our faith. If we walk as disciples in the calling of Jesus Christ, the principle that prevents us from taking the fate into our own hands is that if God does not love everybody, then there can be no love for anybody. Okay? If God does not love everybody, then there can be no love for anybody. If God is not gracious toward all, then he can't be gracious towards any. Do you see the, 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 the inherent difficulty with, well, I'll show grace to the people I like? It's not grace because you're choosing it. Grace and forgiveness is that which you do not choose, that you just release and you let go and you say, you know what, i got to be gracious to everybody. The people I like and the people I don't like. The people who have been so good to me and the people that have been terrible to me. Man, that's hard. Right? It's some stuff I think people can hear me say things, and well, I don't know if I really agree with Jonathan, and I love it. I, I'm glad. Sometimes I don't always agree with everything, Jonathan. I'm like, did I say that? But here's the thing. Even if you don't disagree, that's good. This is something I think is non-negotiable. I think if you don't understand that God has to love everybody or he can't love anybody, God has to be gracious unto all or he can't be gracious unto any. If you don't get that, then you don't get the essence of who Jesus called us and claims us and examples and lives for us to be. And, and, and if that upsets you, good. Because our calling comes out of grace not obligation. And until we get that, because of what Jesus did for me, and Jesus did for you, 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 and I can point and make eye contact with every single person in this place and say, Jesus Christ died for you. John three seventeen. he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Redeemer, because he loves you and he loves you and he loves you and he loves you and he loves you. And because of that love, he has put a calling on your life to go and do likewise.
And if we feel like it's obligation, well, you know, if I don't do it, nobody else will. It's a miserable life. There's got to be joy, right? There's, there's, there's got to be hope. There's got to be passion. Our calling that comes out of grace, when we realize it, we find the joy. We find it in our lives, and we find it in our calling. One of the things that irritates me so much, I, I don't care when people say I don't look like a pastor, I don't talk like a pastor, too young to be a pastor, none of that stuff, but what bothers me is they're like, I'm so glad, Jonathan, that you, know, that you still got your, that your, your youthfulness so that you can have that energy and joy and passion, and I don't believe that. I think when I'm 98 years old, if God lets me live that long, that I'm going to be able to have that same joy and passion to be like Reverend Pitch to say that I can still carry that light years and years and, and, and decades into ministry, that it's not something that, that just, well, you know, I had a lot of energy and I poured it out, but now I've hit my midlife crisis, so I better buy a Harley and start preaching from the pulpit. Like, I just don't see that happening. I don't think that's who I am. Right, why do I write no? Why, why do I have this? I don't need this. I don't know why it's there for me. I say, and then I got to be like, well, did I just offend somebody? I hope not. I, what I'm saying is some people are called to, to preach from here and to proclaim the gospel from here and to have a manuscript that beautifully composes what the Holy Spirit has poured into them. But for me, I can't contain myself because of who God is through grace. Amazing Grace is a song that has affected me a lot more in the past seven or eight years. You know, it's a familiar hymn. It's kind of like Jonah and the Whale. It's one of the first that you learn or can remember singing in church, probably, if you're like me. But the reason it gets me is because it convicts me of my call. There's not a part of Jonathan that deserves or has earned to be a pastor, right? To shepherd the flock. I remember talking with Casey when he preached a great word last week before. I asked him, was he nervous? And he said, yes. And I said, good. The moment that you stop being nervous is the moment you should quit getting in the pulpit. There's not enough age or experience or gifts that should not make us humble to come and proclaim God's word and think that we've been called to shepherd a flock. The only reason that I can do this every single week with confidence and conviction is because of grace, right? The sanctifying grace that was poured out on me, the justifying grace that was allowed in my call to baptism. God's mercy is the only reason so I want you to turn to your neighbor again. I want you to say, I've got a call. Now I want you to look at that person who just told you that and to say, you've got a call and you better answer it. When there is good news to pass on, when your child wins that baseball tournament, Facebook sees all about it. When you get that great report from the doctor that the test results came back negative, the phone tree blows up. When you get that promotion at work, you go and you tell everybody about it. Why aren't you talking about the grace that has saved your life and that was given for everybody? First Timothy, uh, or Second Timothy, excuse me, says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and His own grace. Somebody's going to say, I'm not a Methodist. I say, you don't preach like a Methodist. This grace was given to us and in us in Christ Jesus from the beginning of time. Grace has been poured out and lavished 
upon you. Amazing grace. This news about the love and grace of God is so wonderful and so compelling that it should be our business to share it wherever we go. And again, I'm gregarious, I'm extrovert. I was told at the Black Pelican at our luncheon, I'm loud. Okay, not everybody's going to do it like me, and I get that. But in your own way, there needs to be a joy and a light in your love. People have asked, how does Kitty Hawk keep growing, Pastor? We see this, how do we? You! It grows because of you, because of the light and the love and the grace and the calling that has been lavished upon you. This world is hungry for it. For purpose, 2 Timothy tells us, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it out. Maybe this is why I'll use my notes. Brothers and sisters, the phone is ringing. The call is for you. God is the one calling. And that call changes our lives forever. Amen. I want to invite you to come to the altar as you feel called to celebrate that calling. If you haven't ever heard that calling, to come forward. I I want you to just give us a little wave, a hand wave to pray with you. We're not going to come douse you with water. We just want to pray with you and pour into you. If you love living into that calling, we want to pray for you to receive it. So if you'd like us to pray with you, let us know. A Stephen minister would be happy to go in the prayer room with you if you'd rather do it in a more personal space. I just want to invite you to stand and celebrate amazing grace and know the altar is open in Jesus' name. So stand as we sing and celebrate. last verse. Let's do the last verse. about that hymn is I got a feeling most of y'all knew that by heart. Uh, I, 
I, I just want to give testimony to, uh, this isn't the sermon, this is just within me. Take time with God this week to pray over your calling. Maybe you're fully living into it and fully receiving it and seeing it. For me, it did a lot this week to just make time to say, God, I'm, I'm thankful for where I am and who I am because of you. And when you can relish and celebrate the calling that God has given you, it, 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 it gives you strength and renewed energy to go and to carry that call. Lord, I thank you for each one in here for the gifts and the purpose that comes from the same God, from the same gifts. Lord, I pray that in the calling that you've given, Lord, there are a lot in here who, who, who may not know where you're calling, that maybe it's a new place or a new direction that you're calling. And so, God, I pray that you would give the gift of discernment, that through your Holy Spirit, that there would be those who can hear the call and hear the call to do what our God seeks to be done. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen.